like to talk about the second piano and cello sonata by um, Johannes Brahms. And to help me out, I have a great pianist and a great friend, Alon Goldstein. Alon? Thank you. Great to be here. Um, so um, Alon will help me uh, talk about the chamber music aspect and the collaboration aspect of uh, playing. Let's look at the very beginning. The motif here sounds like a horn to me. Be sure your 16th note is short. Um, I started from the string. And that gives more uh, power. And also I start every 16th notes on the up bow uh, to let the natural uh, ringing of the cello come through. So another way of playing this is uh, up down and then down up. Um. You can see what works for you. The important thing is to remember that we have a four bar subphrase here followed by another four bar subphrase. So um. and that's the second one here. Bars 5 through 8 are particularly tricky for keeping that long line. Notice the uh, hairpins and uh, try to go to the third beat. The highest point is the third beat of each bar. So one, two, three, one, two, three. And then in bars 7 and 8, we have a longer hairpin that goes to the high G. Um, when you think of this shift, try to imagine the high D. Just play the high D a few times, like a horn player that imagines a high note before he uh, leaps up. Uh, and then um, I usually slide or shift on the old bow. So although you might choose to, on the second repeat, uh, slide on the on the new bow. So so. And that can give more power. Uh, it's a little more uh, dramatic. When in Van and I started to work on this great masterpiece, one of the first things that struck me is that Brahms only wrote four symphonies, uh, and yet two of his symphonies, the third and the fourth, were written in the same key that the two sonatas for piano and cello. You know, the, uh, the, the first sonata, E, e minor, minor, is the fourth symphony, also E minor. And then, and then uh, this sonata, the second sonata, Opus 99, third symphony, it's Opus 90, very close, also F major. So obviously he's looking for something grander, bigger, larger in scale, and yet he's choosing this combination that is quite challenging. I mean, a cellist sounding like an orchestra, and obviously in Bali's doing <laughs> an incredible job in sounding like an orchestra. Uh, do you want to say a few things? What, how can you sound like an orchestra? What do you need to do? Do you just play louder? We do play louder. We play very <laughs> loud in this piece. Um, I think um, when we come to bar nine, for example, I play even louder than in the beginning. So don't be shy. Uh, play really close to the bridge there. Um, there's a, a few instances where we sound like orchestra uh, instruments like um, uh, bar 30, one, two, three, four, we, s we could sound like a drum. And another, I think, ahead. another place yeah. in, in bar uh, 92 that that's obviously doesn't sound like anything I heard of a cello before. That's some orchestral effect, maybe. Do you want to play it? Yes, yeah, so. <laughs> So let me talk for a second about how I practice those noodling, which are really tricky. Um, so the first time it comes is in bar 60, and I like um, bringing out the note that is changing. So we have a So focus on the note that is changing, the A, G sharp, G. And um, start by playing just that note, like this. And you 
should uh, pronate, use your index finger to push down the stick uh, as if you're opening a door, I would say. Um, so then you can add the double stops with the open A. After you practice this quite, quite a few times, you can uh, start um, uh, giving a wiggle like this. Uh, basically, so always uh, taking care to bring out the, the lower note, the changing note. Um, yeah. You know, in, from a pianist perspective, you know, orchestral, why orchestral? Well, the beginning. It's obviously a, a string tremolo kind of writing for piano. If I go to the to the second theme, it's such a, a kind of a, you know it sounds like a tutti. The whole orchestra, kind of a Berlin Philharmonic grander mm. orchestral sound. Um, obviously, having um, piano trying to sound like an orchestra in a, in a cello might. Uh, you know, bring us these challenges of balance. And one of the places I think we discussed uh, was the middle of the development section, where the writing for piano is very thick. It's it's this section, starting in bar 75, middle of it, where the piano has the left hand playing chords, the right hand playing offbeat, broken chords. <laughs> There's no particular dynamic. You know that you're in the kind of a, a range of piano pianissimo, and the cello is says pianissimo sempre. Well, so you cannot play it like this, as if it's Debussy. Uh, you have nobody's to. Nobody's going to hear it. Nobody's going to hear it. So I just scratched out the the second P of the pianissimo, and I just have one P. I think that's plenty. <laughs> a little more core to the sound, even exactly. when you play piano. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, it, it always strikes me when you have pianissimo to ask yourself, as you said, which composers pianissimo? And DBC is, I guess, is, is, is more of a color sound. And what you played now to me sounded very pianissimo, but had this core of a piercing quality. And that, and obviously, piano has to be very careful not to drown with too many uh, overtones. The other interesting aspect, I believe, uh, which happens, you know, quite often in, in chamber music, is as pianists, um, we always try to find inspiration in a string instrument or a wind instrument. You know, try to to think of a, of, a, of a clarinet here, or try to think of a you know, uh, sustaining legato as if you're a string instrument. But sometimes I wonder if there are certain places, like in bar 48, uh, exposition, first movement, that maybe the cello should sound a little bit like the piano. So oh, can, you, can you play for us? <laughs> Perhaps not to play it in. because the piano obviously has a different touch. So how did you play it? A little off the string. In other words, you sound yeah. better than piano. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Bars 20 and 21, um, we have a couple of options for, for different fingerings and... You can play the B flat on the D string, or you can shift down and play it on the A string. If you are not shifting, uh, take more time on the second G. So, to make a difference between those two, G, E, D, C shouldn't be repeated exactly the same. Be sure not to accent here. This is a common mistake, um, and I used to accent it too. That's not.
not really great. <laughs> Definitely. The one time we yeah. resolve, and the second time is uh, just to make um, it a little more interesting or more yes. different. And, and does the cello change its color as well? Uh, we are so preoccupied with just keeping that, that wiggle going that I, it's, it's good to remember that, the, first of all, the pianist is the boss here. And also when we go, uh, when we get to uh, 104, we have to really keep up. We can't just, because it's difficult, get slower and slower. Um, it's just not very interesting what we have, we are accompanying you. So, uh, but the color change there, I, I like that a lot. And then, um, you know, Brahms in his writing already makes a ritardando. Uh, Where? In general, just the fact that the music gets slower. Yeah. Just the, we play less notes, we play less rhythm, this, so, you know, and, and then suddenly I'm, I'm holding two bars each chord. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I jumped. No, but yeah, so, so in a way, he, his harmonic progression gets slower and slower in terms of, you know, what he did every bar. Now he's doing every two bars, then it's every four bars, the changes. Uh, so he is actually making a ritardando. We don't need to compound exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. So and, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. we did. I did play with some cellists where, in bar, one eleven to one twelve. Which we should not name. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> one eleven to one twelve. They they started to make a, a, a ritardando, da 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 da, yeah. which I think is unnecessary because Brahms actually writes the ritardando in in the harmonic progression, and and I think you do it wonderfully. How we. It's very organic and coherent. Do you want to play it? Y yeah, let's... Uh, From 107? One. Yes. Okay, we finished, so... What do you think? It's a sigh of the pianist. Yeah, you're happy you finished too. He was very frustrated with just holding long chords <laughs> and finding it very difficult to create a, a long line and a legato and... A Here. <laughs> Sorry to come back again to the te technical aspects. Ah, so mundane. Um, but we can have... Uh, or, just in case you never thought of those fingerings. Great. Um, all right. The rest is easy. The rest is easy, right? <laughs> the rest is history. Oh, hemiolas. Let's see. Well, Brahms was born in the hemiola hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't he? <laughs> there are a lot of hemiolas in this movement, and as uh, typical with Brahms, the bar line also shifts often. The very beginning, you can start by counting on the second beat, and things will feel pretty good. So instead of one, two, three, one, two, three, you can count one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Um, so this is something just to be aware of. When we get to bars 13 and 14, we see uh, we start seeing hemiolas. Um, and here, I think this is the one place where you don't have to worry too much about balance. Um, you can soften your tone. Uh, we have to find those opportunities because otherwise everything is just forte and fortissimo. Um, here, I do hook my bow, so... Notice that I actually like to hear that shift um, on the second finger. We always have to look for opportunities to express, uh, for expression. Yeah, always be aware uh, when the piano starts a theme and we answer the piano. 
So Alani's gonna play a B2 bar 34. Um, so one second, and then, so we have... Obviously you wanna try and match the character of your pianist, and then... in E minor. So in bar 45, for example, we have uh, something that sounds very pianistic to me. That pianist had just played that before. Um, and then obviously as a pianist, we try to sound like uh, brass instruments, trumpets. So it's interesting that the cello tries to sound like the piano who's trying to sound like a trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always trying to be somebody we're not. Um, okay. Or oh, we are all of them. Yeah, that's true. No, obviously, that's as, as, as far as one can possibly go yeah. from F major. And there might be a reason that we will find out in the second movement that he already introduces that, that you know, Neapolitan mm -hmm. note mm -hmm. of F sharp. Going half, half a tone higher. And notice how we have this leap, so... <laughs> and then a few bars later... <laughs> so the, the, the range widens, and you can show it with your face, with, with your color of your tone, play closer to the bridge, darker, darker sound there. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Alon, for being my guest. Great pleasure. Thank you. And see you next time with the second movement. So stay tuned. <laughs>